Hello and welcome to today's PartnerCast session. My name is Lydia Peavy. I'm PartnerCast Program Manager. Today's session is introducing the AWS Well-Architected SaaS Lens. Before we get started, just a reminder that you and your teams can access AWS training, accreditations, and certifications across global time zones and from any location with internet access. We offer dozens of virtual, free, instructor-led, and self-paced online partner training options at aws.training. Also, all our AWS certification exams now offer online proctoring. At AWS, we love to get feedback on how we can improve the learning experience for our AWS partners. If you're interested in sharing your opinion and shaping the future of AWS partner training, consider becoming an AWS partner training feedback contributor. It's an opportunity for you to share your opinion and give feedback. I'll paste a link in the chat window where you can learn more and sign up. After this partner cast, you'll receive a follow-up email with a copy of the deck, a link to the recording, and a list of our resources discussed today. If you have any questions, please add them to the questions chat window in your GoToWebinar panel. At reInvent 2020, we launched the AWS SaaS Lens and the Well-Architected Tool to help organizations accelerate SaaS solution development. The SaaS Lens includes best practices and questions tailored to SaaS workloads intended to drive critical thinking for developing and operating SaaS workloads. In today's ses session, you'll get an overview of the new SaaS Lens and a demo. Now I'll hand things off to your speakers, Kevin Mueller and Oren Ravani, Raveni, Senior Partner Solutions Architects with the AWS SaaS Factory team. Hello, welcome to the AWS PartnerCast. Today we're going to talk about the well-architected SaaS lens. My name is Kevin Mueller. I'm joined by Oren Rivenalbi, and we're both Senior Partner Solutions Architect with the SaaS Factory program. Our agenda today is to discuss a little bit about SaaS and the SaaS Factory program, and then we'll jump right into the well-architected SaaS lens, giving a little bit of background and talking about how it was integrated into the well-architected tool. This is the second lens integrated into the tool. And then we'll give a little demo of the SaaS lens. We're going to wrap up and then have a little Q&A after that. So thanks for joining. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Oren. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. I'm Oren Ruveni, a solutions architect from the SaaS Factory team. And I'm going to talk briefly about SaaS and the SaaS Factory program. SaaS is a software delivery model in which software is licensed on a subscription basis and is centrally hosted. And we see a growing trend of organizations that are either building new solutions as SaaS or migrating their existing solutions to a SaaS delivery model. And I think that this data point can explain that. This is a survey from IDC from late 2018 that shows that SaaS application delivery model is expanding at rapid pace. You can see here that 72% of the customers are considering SaaS. 21% of them has a model in which all new applications are SaaS first. An additional 29% have a company-wide initiative to increasingly migrate application to SaaS models. And an additional 22% evaluate moving applications to SaaS when software contracts renew. This movement is being seen across all verticals, while new and existing application providers are anxious to get the financial, market, and agility benefits that are associated with SaaS. Let's talk a bit about the value proposition of SaaS, and it is relevant both for customers and the service providers. Let's start with the customers. The customer gets a simplified IT management experience when using SaaS. The customer does not need to host or maintain the software product. Instead, the product is hosted and managed by the software provider. And the customer consumes the service when needed and as needed. In terms of time to value, software is delivered as, as a service and is easily accessible. Customers can just sign up and start using the product with little to no assistance. And onboarding can be made largely frictionless, shortening time to value and productivity. Customers only pay for what they use with no long-term contracts or upfront costs, and this lowers the risk, and it also, allows, it also allows customers to try and buy the best product for their needs. 
and they can also switch to a different product as needed. As for the SaaS providers, first, they have the ability to be agile and to rapidly innovate. Development in the cloud significantly reduces the costs and risks of experimentation. And this, this makes rapid innovation possible and much less expensive. In addition to that, agile development with microservices architecture and continuous releases shorten cycle time. This means that customers get updates faster, they get bug, fi fix bug fixes sorry, faster, and it accelerates products with a competitive edge. This benefits both the service provider and the customer, of course. Second, software deployed in the cloud can be scaled up and down rapidly. This allows managing customer growth and handling peak times dynamically and automatically. It is much easier, low touch and cost optimized. And the multi-tenant architecture is also a cost-effective construct since it provides a shared infrastructure for our customers, for example. Third, SaaS products can provide significant operational advantages by leveraging SaaS concepts, such as multi-tenancy that I just mentioned, and microservices architecture, which allow high growth products to be highly profitable. And last but not least, SaaS products delivered on a sub subscription model provides a predictable st stream of recurring revenue um, that is valued much higher than one-time license fees. And when executed and managed well, executed and when managed well, migration to the SaaS delivery model has a positive impact on business validation and stock price for business for public companies. Now let's talk a bit about the SaaS factory program, which is a part of the AWS partner network. The goal of the AWS SaaS Factory program is addressing this market need and the movement, the significant movement that we see to a SaaS delivery model. The program brings together a combination of SaaS content, tooling, and resources that can provide guidance and expertise. And the goal here is to accelerate the SaaS journey for AWS partners and maximize the potential of the SaaS solutions that they build on top of AWS. Since it was launched, it was in reInvent 2017. We have worked with hundreds of AWS APN partners and helped them to build SaaS offerings on AWS. That includes industry leaders such as F5, Trend Micro, Delbumi, BMC, and startups such as Wirewheel. Um, these topics are representative topics that we address in our engagements, as well as the content that we publish. And SaaS Factory content and best practices addresses these and other topics, which often being discussed in a move to SaaS on AWS, in the SaaS journey on AWS. Some example topics are, for example, on the business side, go-to-market planning, marketing approach, product roadmap, and sales model. And on the technical side, some common topics are tenant isolation, billing and metering, and the identity and access. The outputs and the outcome of those engagements are usually a transformational change, a revised architecture, a proof of concept, and the benefits are accelerated time to market, quality of service, and operational efficiency. Now that we talked about SaaS and SaaS, the SaaS factory program, let's start talking about the well architected framework and the well architected SaaS lens. The well architected, the well -architected framework helps, helps, the, um, helps cloud architects build the optimal architecture for their applications. It is focusing on five pillars, five aspects security, reliability, performance, cost optimization, and operational excellence. The well-architected framework provides a consistent approach for customers and partners to evaluate their architecture and implement designs and best practices that scale over time. Lenses extend the guidance offered by the well-architected framework, and it focuses on specific domains. 
For an optimal outcome, use the relevant lenses together with the well-architected framework and the five pillars. This means that you first do the well-architected review, the general review, and then you go to the lens in order to, order, order to focus on a specific domain. The well-architected tool is being used to document and measure your work, workload, as we will see. And now I'm going to hand over to Kevin, which will elaborate about the well-architected tool. Thanks, Oren. The well-architected tool is documented in the AWS documentation. And the tool is used to assist you in documenting decisions that you make and then providing recommendations for improving your workloads and to guiding you to make your workloads more reliable. It's integrated into the management console. It's the second lens integrated into the tool. Now, the SaaS lens for the Well Architect tool focuses on a SaaS technical domain. And so you can learn architectural best practices and measure your architecture against the best practices that SAS Factory has uh, identified. And then uh, you walk through a series of questions. And so there's 14 questions in the SAS lens. And we'll go over that in a little bit more here in, in, in detail. The main goal is to identify what we call high risk areas. So depending on how you answer a question, it's either considered high risk, medium risk, or well architected. I've been able to conduct several reviews with several partners. Um, not going to read this. You can pause and read these if you want. But the one thing I want you to take away is both partners, they walked away identifying new features they need to add to their development plan. Here is uh, the workloads that are defined inside the, eight, the, the tool. And so here I have one called SaaS application. And you can have many workloads, maybe one for your entire system or maybe one for subsystems with inside your system. So here uh, you define a workload by pressing that button over there on the right and you define your workload. There's several questions uh, that you have to answer to generate the workload. And then once you get into that workload, you can review it and you'll review the 14 questions. And so here's an example. First, you see the question up top in bold. This is the security pillar, the number two question. Number two there, you have basically information about the question. And then you get into the best practices. This question happens to have two. Then you have the notes section after that, where if you're giving your review to yourself, you can take notes and then share those amongst the team. Some uh, customers, they'll have reviews conducted by a solutions architect, or there's a well-architected competency program. Those partners can do the review for you and they'll take the notes and then you can distribute it to the team. Going over to the right, each best practice that is listed there, you see those in bold, and then there's additional information about those best practices over here. And then up on the top right, we have what we call signpost. Uh, these are uh, recommendations from the SAS Factor team of technical content you can go look at to learn how to do some of the best practices listed inside the question. So question layout. So now the best practices that belong to each question, there's three types. The first is required, then we call it a good best practice, and then the best best practice. So what does this mean? Uh, well, before I get into that, I must say that uh, every question is gonna have one required and one best. It might not have a good just two, just like the previous example we saw had two best practices. However, there might be exceptions where there might be more than one uh, required or more than one best, but that's not very often. So what does required and best mean? So required is absolutely necessary before going to production. If you lack implementation of the required best practice, you might have a high risk issue inside your system in production. A good best practice are what we recommend customers to have, but absent these, you might be of a medium risk. And the best, again, the best best practice is the best possible state a customer can be in. Once again, usually there's one, but there might be two, but generally there's just one. But what does required really mean? I was still unsure when I read the textbook uh, definitions that I just gave you, and it was Explain to me like this. 
if I were to review 100 workloads out there and 80% of the workloads are doing this one best practice to be successful, that is probably required because everybody needs to do that to be successful. Lacking that, those 20% that don't have that, are probably high risk of an issue. Now, take those same 100 workloads and 10% of them are doing this one best practice and being successful. Doing that one thing is probably the best state you can be in. It's not required. You can still go to production and succeed, but if you really want to be the well-architected, you want to implement the best, best practice. So now questions, when you go through a review, you answer the questions, you talk about, you, you highlight which best practices that you've implemented in your workload, and after that's done, the tool will inform you that you might be at high risk. And again, the workload is missing the implementation of the required best practice. A medium risk is um, you probably have the required done, uh, but maybe one or more good best practices are done, but you haven't done the best practice, best best practice, then you're at medium risk. And then you're well architect. You've implemented the best best practice and you're good to go. So high risk, uh, here's an example. We have a question, we have our introduction, and then you can see there's three best practices. The top best practice is the required one. And they did the good one. They've defined an SLA for each tenant, but they haven't implemented throttling policies to limit the effect. And so this question would be highlighted as uh, high risk, and then it's suggesting doing these improvement plans to get to well-architected. Here's an example of a medium risk. We've implemented the required best practice. We haven't done the good or the best. Well, the good is the second best practice. The best is the third one there. So it'll be marked as medium risk. And then here's an example of a well-architected. We've implemented the required. We didn't really do the good, but that's okay. But we implemented the best best practice. And we'll say there's no risk detected and you're well on your way to being well architected for this one question. So before I turn it over to Oren, I just want you to understand that um, you kind of know how, where to find the well architected tool. It's in the management console. Uh, you can conduct reviews of workloads. A review is really reviewing the questions of for uh, like the SAS lens, there's 14 questions. And then you mark which best practices have been implemented in that workload. And then after the end, uh, you can review that workload to see what's uh, high risk, medium risk, or well architected. Orrin's going to give you a little bit more detail about the tool. And so with that, here's Orrin. Thanks, Kevin, for elaborating about the question layout. Now, let's go over three important elements in the well architected tool, which are milestones, improvement plans, and reports. And there are times in which I want to stop the review and define the current situation as a milestone. And in order to do that, I'll save and exit the review. And I'll click on save, miles, save milestone. Let's call it milestone three. And now it is the, the current situation and the current gap are defined as milestone three. Now, I'll go into milestone three. I'll see that I have one moment into SAS lens, I'll see that I have um, an overview of the date, the questions answered, and the risks list. Now, you can see that I have four high risks and zero medium risks. Now, when I go to the improvement plan, I can see a list of the, well, I can see the details of the gap that I have, which is, which is the improvement items. Um, the naming convention of this, in, this list is um, the pillar name. You can see that uh, this is a security-related gap and the uh, number of the improvement item. I can filter it by pillar, by the way, and by the risk type. Um, the second one is about operational excellence. Also, the third one and the fourth one is a cost optimization related gap. Now, 
For each one of those items, I have some suggestions. I have the recommended improvement items. And those links will take me to the improvement plan documentation. We have an improvement plan for each question. Uh, this example, in this example, you can see that uh, this is the improvement plan for the second question in the security pillar. And the improvement plan specifies some specific guidelines and some specific references that will help you to mitigate the, this gap that you have. Now, let's go back to the tool. And I might want to create a report of the current situation, the current milestone that I'm in. In order to do that, I'll just click generate a report. This will generate a PDF document, which will describe the current milestone that I'm in. You can see the milestone name here, some more details about the workload, about the region that the work workload resides in, um, the questions that I answered um, on, and the risk lists. You can see the high risk list, you can see the related questions here. And now Kevin and I will elaborate about the questions that we have in the well-architected lens. That was great, Oren, thanks. So to kick us off, I was wondering, Oren, what is your favorite question? My favorite question is in the reliability pillar. And it talks about something that we call a noisy neighbor. A noisy neighbor is a situation in which a specific tenant causes load that impacts other tenants' availability and reliability. And we need to find a ways in order to mitigate this noisy neighbor situation. Now, most of the times when we talk about a noisy neighbor, we will look into specific components in which this situation can be caused. And let's look at the uh, methods and solutions that we offer in order to mitigate it. So we can use throttling policies in order to limit the effects that the noisy tenants have on the system. Um, this means that uh, we can limit API calls, we can limit the rate of using um, the, storage, um, the storage layer, for example, in order to make sure that we're not getting into a noisy neighbor situation. We can define SLAs for each tier, which means that in each tier, the tenants will have a defined SLA that they cannot breach, which will prevent um, noisy neighbor situation. And there are ways in which we will partition the tenant load in order to limit the area of effect. For example, the specific tenant will get uh, its own storage unit, its own compute unit, so it will not be able to, to, to impact other tenants. Now, those solutions are obviously, um, it all depends on your architecture, it all depends on your product, but those are possible solutions that can help you mitigate the situation. Now, I'll take a minute in order to go over the other questions in the reliability pillar. And the second question talks about how we proactively detect and maintain, or um, maybe it will be more suitable to say, how do you proactively detect and maintain tenant health? And obviously it is um, very important to understand that the system acts um, uh, normally and is healthy, but it is really important to understand what about specific tenants. And while the system health can be okay, a specific tenant can be, uh, can, can have issues. So in order to understand what about specific tenant in the system, there are, but uh, here are the possible solutions. We can add tenant context. Actually, this is one of the mandatory, even I would say the mandatory requirements. Add tenant context to application logs in order to reactively manage tenant health. This is mandatory because it enables me to understand what's going on 
on a specific tenant resolution rather than the whole system. Another method to look into is introducing detailed tenant insights to enhance, uh, to enhance health from forensics. This means that I will have specific tenant metrics. This means that I will have visualization, data visualization that also looks into specific tenants. And another important method is proactively identif identifying tenant issues with policies and alarms. This means that once I have a, an issue within a specific tenant, or maybe I'm going to have an issue, uh, an alarm will pop up that will uh, make me aware of that. The third question is about how you're testing multi-tenant capabilities of your SaaS application. And some uh, methods and some tests that we propose to, to do on the system is, for example, validating a noisy neighbor, the, the ability to contain a noisy neighbor situation by uh, scaling the system, for example, and uh, making sure that uh, the system and uh, the tenants are still available and the, they're still acting reliably. Another method is about exercising key workflows under multi-tenant load. This means that some core processes in the system uh, needs to be tested under heavy load, under the usage of multiple tenants in order to make sure that they can contain this kind of load. And another example is about uh, testing the scan and repeatability of onboarding tenants. Um, for example, onboarding multiple tenants at once, making sure that the automation of the onboarding process is working um, uh, under uh, different configurations and different parameters and so on. Um, now, Kevin, what is your favorite question? My favorite question is security one. How are you associating tenant context with users and applying that context with inside your SaaS architecture? At SaaS Factory, we like to talk about something that we call the, the SaaS identity. Oops, that's right here. And, you know, users log in, but it's usually a, a organization, a firm, or, you know, a firm or something that is the tenant. And then users are part of that tenant. And as you operate your system, you want to be able to understand what type of behavior you want to do, what features you want, and that has to be based off of something. We like to say the SaaS identity. You have to come up with this concept of a SaaS identity, which is a mixture of the user information and the tenant information together. So you have to define whatever that is inside your system. Great. Now, when that user logs in, you want to use some type of identity provider to kind of bind that user and the tenant together and we call and create this context. And that context has to flow through your system so your system can behave properly. Now, after that, you know, that's a little bit generic, that context, and you can do any number of ways of doing that. And so we won't get into the details there. Uh, but once you're inside your system and you have this context, you want to be able to create libraries or framework to apply the context outside of the view of developers. Developers have a hard job enough already, but let's let them focus on the business functionality and not have to worry about the tenant. And so these libraries and frameworks will take that tenant context and do what they need to do. Uh, an example is maybe logging. So you want to be able to log the tenant context within every log statement that you have. Well, have a, a library or framework do that and not have the developer put that into the log line that they're trying to do. Uh, that's an example. Security one, how do you create that context with inside your SaaS architecture? That's my favorite question. And also with inside the secure, security pillar, we have a second question called, um, how are you ensuring that tenant resources are protected from cross-tenant access? This is another example where we just have uh, two best practices are required in a best. Uh, you can use coarse strain const uh, grain constructs and application of voice enforced policies. Uh, some people might call this kind of a, a silo type model. You could use an AWS account or a VPC. That's what we mean by kind of force, uh, coarse grain. After that, if you want to get a little bit more detailed, you can use a combination of IAM uh, policies 
or application enforced policies because IM is, is not the actual solution you should use for every situation. There are times when you can't use that and you need to do it yourself inside your application. That's security. So Oren, what's the next pillar you want to go over? I'll go over the operational excellence pillar. And you can see that we have four questions here. This pillar is about making sure that the system is operating as expected, but also to make sure, and you, we will see that, uh, especially in questions four, uh, three and four, that um, some core processes, some core operations in the system are automated and not prone to errors. So let's start with the first one. Um, Ops one is about how do you effectively monitor and manage the operational health in your multi-tenant environment? And this is about gaining enough visibility in order to understand that our system and specific tenants are working as expected. Um, in order to do that, and you can see that this is a similar, those are similar methods to the question in, our, in the reliability pillar about reliability of specific tenants. We first need to include tenant context into application logs. This is the most basic thing through which we can understand what's going on in specific tenants. Um, this is how we understand the activity within tenants and we can understand, for example, um, that the responsiveness is okay within a tenant, that the activity within a tenant is okay. Uh, we're going to elaborate about the, those insights in a bit in, in a, in in a non-health aspect. Um, the stage after um, just get, uh, getting the context of specific tenants is collecting detailed tenant insights. Um, those are specific metrics that will help me understand the, better um, the activity and uh, uh, other health-related metrics uh, for specific tenants. And the most, let's say, the more advanced stage is about using purpose-built tools in order to use those insights, gain visibility in terms of tenant health, but also set some policies and alerts that will help me to be um, proactive in terms of uh, making sure that uh, I have normal tenant health in the system. The second question is also about capturing metrics, but it is in a more general aspect. And it is more about understanding the general operation of tenants. And this is important because when I have tenant visibility, when I have specific tenants visibility, I can understand what's going on in terms of activity, which um, features are they using, they, they are using, and um, what is their usage pattern in general, what is the responsiveness of the system, and things that will help me um, to make important technological decisions, but also business-related decisions. And practically, I can improve the system like that. I can define my roadmap with the help of those insights. So the first stage would be capturing low fidelity tenant activity metrics, which means that I will capture some metrics whenever I can, um, where possible. The second stage is to focus on some high value workflows and capture tenant aware exact metrics and uh, let's say more precise metrics that will help me to better understand, to have better visibility into those high value workflows. Now those can be technological um, high value workflows in terms of technology, but also in terms of business. Let's say that I have a workflow which is connected to a core feature of the application. Then it will surely be very interesting for me. The next stage, the more advanced stage here, is to create a complete view of tenant consumption. And as I mentioned, those insights can um, help me make a lot of important decisions, whether they are business-related decisions or technology-based decisions. 
The third question is about onboarding new tenants into your system. And obviously this is a very important stage. Um, customer experience is very important here. And um, in terms of operations, it affects both the customer and the service provider. Um, you can see that by the methods that we're specifying here. The most basic um, situation is where you use manually triggered scripts in order to provision new tenants. When customers are advancing or are evolving their SaaS offering, they are um, most of the times using uh, an automated process in order to onboard tenants. And the more advanced stage here is to provide a fully automated self-service user experience. That means that the user just goes into the um, service, uh, let's say, portal, um, they create uh, in a self-service manner their own, uh, let's say that they're registering and logging in as a user. And uh, in the background, a new tier, uh, uh, sorry, a new tenant is being provisioned and all is happening in an automated manner. Um, this is also important, uh, um, of course, um, regarding human errors. Once I have a fully automated product, I will most likely have less errors. The last question, question number four, is about how do you support the need for tenant-specific customizations? And we know that um, each tenant, they can have uh, some specific requirements, they can have specific configuration, and the, let's say that the anti-pattern here is to manually configure each tenant's environment. And we, we do not want to do that because one of the strengths that we have on our SaaS solution is the ability to automate the configuration and to automate updates and product changes. Once we have manual interference here, this means that we won't be able to get it. We won't be able to enjoy this benefit. So. In order to uh, make sure that we can be more, that, that we enable this agility, that we enable this automation, that we're causing less errors in the system, we can use feature flags in order to manage the, those tenant varia variations. Um, and we can also support unique tenant requirements via shared application customizations. Now, I would say that the more advanced stage here is to create a kind of, um, self-service manner configuration service for each user, which will be um, automated, of course. And uh, it will allow the user to customize the tenant uh, themselves, while this is all automated and won't interfere with any updates, any changes to the product that we want to roll out, and so on. And now I will go to the next pillar. Next, I'll go into the performance efficiency pillar. And the purpose of this pillar is making sure that the system is performing as expected, but also that it performs on, in high efficiency. And in a bit, we'll see what that means. So we have three questions here. And the first question is about how do you prevent one tenant from impacting the performance of another tenant? Now, since we're under the performance pillar here, this means that we're strictly talking about performance impact and not the availability impact or reliability impact, for example, like in the reliability pillar. And in order to uh, make sure that one tenant is not interrupting another, other tenants in the system in terms of performance, uh, we can do several things. And there are, there are a couple of methods here that I would like to talk about. Um, first, and I think that this is, um, it depends on the use case, but this is, this can be a kind of a basic method. We can silo high demand tenant resources. This means that um, resources are being assigned for specific tenants. And this is how we, we make sure the tenant, uh, a specific tenant cannot interrupt another tenant, just has 
its own assigned resource. The next method talks about combining a tenant, a tenant aware policies with added capacity in order to address tenant spikes. And this means that I'm defining policies that just scale up the system when I see that I have uh, excessive load. And I'm using a kind of a buffer, uh, we call it a cushion, that will um, make sure that I can contain this load while I'm scaling up the system. The next method talks about throttling policies. And this is simply about throttling the activity of those tenants in order to prevent them to, from impacting other tenants. The next and last method is about decomposing and deploying services in a pattern that aligns with tenant loads and the performance expectations. Let's say that I have a uh, specific component that I know with, that is performance intensive. I will take this component and, and I will architect it in such manner that will contain the load um, of specific tenants and prevent this performance impact. Um, this means that uh, I can have components which are, uh, let's say, more performance intensive that will be architected in one manner and some other components will be architected in another way, which aligns with the usage pattern um, of, of, of those specific components. Now, the second question talks about how do, how do you ensure that consumption of infra infrastructure resources aligns with the activity and workloads of tenants? And this question specifically talks about the elasticity that we create in the system and the way that we scale the system in order to contain uh, the, the, in order to satisfy the performance that the system and the tenants require. Now, there are several methods here. And the first method is about using a tenant profile data in order to configure static scaling policies. And in this situation, I already know the expected performance, and I'm just um, defining those uh, scaling policies, static scaling policies, which will make sure that I have um, specific, that I can satisfy those uh, performance requirements. As you can see here on the right, we configure them um, those scanning policies based on historical consumption trends. The next method, which is a bit more advanced, is about um, building dynamic tenant scanning policies around standard AWS metrics. And this means that I'm using AWS metrics such as CPU consumption, for example, in order to understand that I need to scale up the system, that I need to scale up a certain component, for example. The next method talks about scaling based on application generated tenant insights. And this is a more, let's say, accurate method. This method relies on application generated data, uh, which is, um, this, this is the most accurate data that I can get because this is the application level data and not just the CPU level that I see in the system. And uh, relying on this data, I can make sure that I'm scaling um, the system or a specific component um, as expected and as I need to. The third and last question is about how do you enable varying levels of performance for different tenant tiers and plans? And it is, this question is basically about the ability to define and, and um, implement those levels of performance uh, per tier or per plan types. And I want to use an example for that question. Um, let's say that I have the free tier of my system and let's say that I have a premium tier. Now, 
The first method that you see here is about apply throttling to lower tier tenants. Um, this basically means that the free tier will be throttled and the premium tier will not be throttled. Uh, this is a rather basic method, but it will help me to prevent noisy neighbors in the free tier. The second method is about using policies to shape application performance for each tenant tier. And this is already about defining SLAs and defining some specific numbers, specific thresholds, which will prevent um, the, the tiers from um, going over a certain threshold that I have in the system. The next and last method here is about optimizing the experience for different tenant tiers. And this means that I'm architecting my system and the components, the, the microservices within my system in order to be, and I'm deploying and designing them around tiers, which means that I can offer a silo experience or an, an optimized, experience, optimized experience of other sorts of another sort, which can um, optimize the way that I can provide my, my service. And in other words, and let's, let's use an example here, I can use different resource clusters for, for, for different tiers. I can use a certain logic for each component, which will understand that a higher tier is getting um, a specific, uh, a defined set of performance and uh, uh, the, the premium tier is getting a better set of performance. So the, the ability to optimize the experience for different tenant tiers is the most uh, advanced level here. This is, uh, let's say that this is a very high uh, awareness of the system and the components of the um, tenant types and plan types, if you will, that exist within the system. And now I'll, I'm going to hand over back to Kevin. Hey, thanks, Oren. So the last pillar is cost optimization. And in a sense, it's one of the hardest, um, one of the hardest pillars to achieve of calculating what we call the cost per tenant or, or cost per customer, some people like to say. So there's two questions in cost optimization. We kind of broke it out between collecting the metrics that you need to kind of calculate a consumption by a tenant. And then the second question is more about how do you correlate that consumptions with the cost to be able to come up with that cost per tenant. So let's look at question one. You know, how do you measure the resource consumption of an individual tenant? Uh, generally, we are prescribed building multi-tenant architectures that have shared resources. This is the, the easiest way to get the most cost-effective solution. And there's three best practices. Uh, the required is proximate tenant consumption, uh, and then build a rich view of tenant consumptions, and then use that tenant consumptions insight to shape the operational architectural efficiency. So in the approximate uh, tenant consumption, you could see using some some broad measure to measure that consumption. So uh, let's say you have an API-based SaaS solution uh, and you're using the API gateway. You could kind of look at the access logs, see what tenants are using the system, how many calls they're making, and then make, break, make broad uh, statements about the consumption each tenant is having and not really pay attention to maybe some compute or data store that you have behind. And that's what we mean by kind of approximation. But then, you know, the next thing is you want to build a rich view of that tenant consumption. You know, here, now we might need to add some type of metrics into the system that you're publishing. And you're looking at not just the API gateway, but you're looking at compute metrics. And you're looking at some stores metrics. And you're putting that together and then providing a view into that tenant consumption. And after you've collected all that metrics and you have a nice view of tenant consumptions, now can we feed that back into the system to kind of shape our operational and architectural efficiency? Um, that is the best place to be. You don't have to be there to be in production, but it's the best place to be. So we didn't really talk about cost here, 
we were talking about the metrics that you need to get and collect so that you can say, hey, tenant one is consuming 10% of my resources. First, an approximation, then a more granular view, and then we're taking that granular view, feeding it back into our system. The second question, um, how are you correlating tenant consumption with the cost of your infrastructure? We just have two best practices here. You're manually aggregating and correlating consumption with cost. So in the first question, cost one, maybe we're just approximating. We're looking at the API gateway and we can see that tenant one is using 10% of our API calls and those type of things. And then somebody goes over to the billing and pulls down our AWS bill for that day or month and says, okay, I'm gonna apply 10% of that to tenant one. And now I, I've manually aggregated and correlated my consumptions across all my tenants, and I kind of know what I'm doing at a high level. The best place to be is to use automation to correlate all that tenant consumptions. You can automatically go use the API to pull in all your billing data, and maybe you do it at an hourly rate or a daily rate, and you are collecting all your metrics from your system that talks about this consumption per tenant, multiplying it towards that cost, and now you have a more detailed view. Sounds easy to explain. It's really hard to do. A lot of people really haven't gotten to that level of sophistication. There's partners out there that can help you do that. Uh, in the improvement plan, we mentioned three. Cloud Zero comes right off to the top of my head as somebody that's really doing that well. Uh, and you really have to focus or make a decision on this cost, you know, how much value does it bring? Uh, going back to cost one, you know, doing that approximation, maybe that's good enough and you can stop there and that's totally fine. Because uh, building that rich view, maybe that's too much detail, too much hard and you're focusing. But you need to plan ahead during the initial phases of your SaaS implementation to kind of think about how you're doing that and figuring out where you can bring the best value. And then don't hesitate to use third-party partners to help do that cost per tenant. Uh, if you're a startup company, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of numbers that you want to produce to see if your company is doing well. And doing that cost per tenant is one of those things that can feed into that. So we're going to wrap it up now. So you can learn more uh, at the following places. Every well-architected lens has a white paper. So here's the link for the well-architected SaaS lens white paper. I know you can't click the link, but you can pause and maybe do a search and use this as a reference. Also, the SaaS factory program has what we call the Insight Hub. The Insight Hub is a, a whole bunch of technical and business content with, that have been developed over the last four years, talking about the very aspects of SaaS and some of the details and architectural reference diagrams and white papers and a whole bunch of other things to give you more information about building SaaS. So in summary, uh, SaaS is a movement that has gained momentum. Many years ago, more than 72% of firms were out there were thinking about developing or consuming some type of SaaS product. With well-architected SaaS lens, you can review your workload and find high-risk items. And then go fix those items and then come back and resolve them in the, in the tool and save them as a milestone so that you can see the progress that you're making and reduce the number of high-risk items. Once again, learn more with the improvement plans, the signposts that are inside the lens, the white paper, and the SaaS Factory Resource Hub. With that, I think we're going to open it up to a little Q&A. All right. I think we have uh, addressed most, if not all, of the questions on the Q&A panel via text. Um, if there are any outstanding or if you haven't asked them, please throw them in the chat right now. Um, we will send a follow-up with a copy of the deck as well as um, the, a link to the recording as soon as it's available. Um, and any, any follow-up questions that, that we didn't get to, um, I didn't see any come through that we didn't address um, via chat, um, but please do let us know via chat. Um, and when we uh, close out the session, you'll receive a, a prompt for a survey and you have the ability to uh, add additional topics 
you'd like to see about well architected or any other part or cast topics you'd like to see in future sessions. Um, I believe that's everything. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our partner cast session. Look forward to seeing you again in future sessions. Thank you, Kevin and Oren, for uh, joining us and presenting on the new uh, well architected SAS lens. We've got additional well architected sessions coming up. You can see those in our partner cast training uh, schedule. I've been posting those to the chat, so hopefully, you saw that link come through. Those are available for you. Um, and we will be here uh, for you for additional partner cast topics. Uh, and uh, let us know if there's anything else that you'd like to see. Thanks, everyone. And that will close our partner cast session. Have a great day.